how do we know if our students really get it? Now, I don't know about you, but I've spent many nights at home on my couch grading multiple choice quizzes that I'd given out in class or grading problems that I had assigned. And when it was all said and done, I had a grade for my students, but I don't know if I necessarily understood what they really knew. Now, what if there was a simple way for my students to create something where they could explain in their own words exactly what they'd learned in my class? Let me introduce you to Laura Bell from RMC 13. Laura teaches chemistry over at Stockbridge High School, and using nothing more than a simple flip cam, Laura has her students create videos where they explain exactly what they've learned in class. Now, we hope this sparks some great ideas about how you could use video assessment in your own class. And as always, enjoy. Hello, my name is Laura Bell. I teach at Stockbridge High School. And today I wanted to talk about using video to demonstrate and assess learning. Specifically, I wanted to talk about student-produced videos and their applications in core content classes. So as opposed to just technology electives, how can these things be uh, useful and used well in a core class like chemistry? All right, so I think the first question a lot of people ask is, well, is this really worth the time? Is it something I should uh, really cut out time from my curriculum to do? It's already so packed with things I have to cover. So um, there's several reasons why I think this is helpful and why I think it is useful. And one of them is expressed by the look of the student in this slide right here is that I think many kids become frustrated and bored with a lot of the things that are in a traditional curriculum. They get tired of worksheets. They're not really engaged by lecture. Additionally, um, having the things that students do documented on the camera helps the students to take time to reflect on why they're doing certain things because they have to explain it to their audience. Um, I'm a science teacher. And many times I find students, they really do enjoy labs. But one of the problems I sometimes encounter is that students are so excited about getting into the activity and trying the lab that they don't really pause to think about why they're doing things this way. And I think it's, it's possible that many times they know the answers to these questions, but they're not taking the time to reflect on it. And I'm not convinced that they know it. I'm not really sure. And so by having the video and having to explain this to an audience who's going to see it later, why they're doing these things and why they're using to this piece of equipment, it makes them really think about it because they have to actually explain this to someone else. And so they're forced to really think about, well, why are we doing this? And well, now I need to explain that so that other people will know. An additional factor that the videos help with is peer review. When I use the video labs in my class, I have the students peer review each other's final videos when they're done. And I think this is helpful for several different reasons. Um, first of all, they have everything documented. And so you can also include people who maybe were absent on a particular day can still help and see what was going on. And it provides an audience besides me for the students because they know that their peers are going to be watching this. And I found a lot of times students' peers are harsher critics than even I am. And they can give some really good feedback. Additionally, I think it helps engage the students in looking at work other people are doing and well, using what they know and learning from their peers to evaluate the other groups. Students really like to criticize each other. And of course, we want to keep it constructive and positive. But um, I think a lot of them actually enjoy the opportunity to do that. And it also encourages them and forces them to kind of think about what they've learned in class. All right, so hopefully at this point you're starting to think, all right, I'm seeing some applications of this, but I really just don't have the time. But I'm hoping to convince you that maybe that's not necessarily the case. It depends on how you approach video in your classroom. I, for instance, have a very busy curriculum, um, but I still am able to do this because I cut out a lot of time when it comes to editing. I don't have my students edit their videos at all, actually. So I'd say keep it minimal or just don't even do editing. Keep the focus on the content itself and communicating it with other students and their peers. And don't worry about little things like background noise. 
And if you do that, it really does save a lot of time. I think a lot of time students in technology classes might spend two days or more on the editing part where you don't need to do that. And in that instance, it makes it so that a lot of the labs I do don't take that much longer than they usually would had the students been writing out all of their answers to things instead if they're using the video method. Maybe you're wondering, well, what does it really look like? So I want to take some time now. I'm going to show you um, some uh, one of the examples from my own classroom with students doing what I call a video lab. So a video lab is where the students document how they're setting up an experiment, how they're going to test their ideas, recording their data, and also their conclusions. And so it's alternative to the typical lab report style of doing things. We're trying to figure out if different solutions affect our potato pieces. We're using distilled water, tap water, and salt water. We don't think distilled water or tap water will affect any of the potatoes, but salt water will because it is a hypertonic water solution. Tomorrow we will be able to tell if the salt water or, or if the other solutions have affected the potato. So as you can see in this scene, I have some of the students preparing for one of the video labs. Now, before they ever get a camera in their hands, I have them do a lot of preparation. So that way, once they do have the camera, it's actually used efficiently and they're not wasting time goofing around and being unsure of what to do. That will also help you save a lot of time. I have the students make an outline of their script and also decide who's going to speak for various parts of the lab. For example, who's going to um, tell the audience what the purpose of this lab is? What are some of the things that are important for them to say? You don't need to have the students make a word for word script because you don't want them reading off their script to the camera. But it's useful, I think, to have them decide what they need to be talking about. What are the key points? So it's been considered before they even have the camera in their hands. Additionally, you should build in checkpoints if you want to keep your students on track. As you can see in this example I have here, I have a little checkpoint that um, tells them that they need to have finished this part one by a certain time. The time isn't printed on there, so that way you can use it in different class periods and you can just post a time on the board, say, all right, part one needs to be done by 1.30. And I have a spot there where I can sign off that the students have shown me this has been accomplished. I think this is really important if you want to keep things um, on track and also keep the students focused because otherwise, um, you know, the students, they enjoy playing around with the camera and if they're not held to a particular time frame for finishing things, they probably will take advantage of all of the time you give them for unnecessary activities that probably aren't really part of what you intended. In this next clip, you can see there's a little bit of goofing off going around in the background. This is something that is, you know, probably not what you want in your video lab. It's distracting and it's probably going to make it so that the other students aren't really listening to what's happening. So behavior expectations are another important thing. After having that happen in one of the first video labs that I did, I changed it so that I give students a peer review guideline in advance. It looks like this. So with the peer review guidelines, I have a space for the peer review comments. I have a space for my comments and the students can see before they've even started the video lab, what are some of the things they're going to be evaluated on? Chances are that within any of your research teams, there'll be at least one kid who at least kind of cares about their grade. So I have a particular place on the peer review where I have guidelines where I say that, all right, there's minimal distractions other than background noise. It's always going to be there. Don't make them worry about that. That's really hard to avoid, but there's not extra gestures, noises, and so on that isn't important to making the video. What kind of equipment do you need? You really don't need that much. I was able to purchase everything I need with the success of a single grant. Um, the things that you have to have are cameras. You have to have cameras for your students to use. They don't need to be fancy. Um, the ones I use are the flip cameras, the flip video cameras, which I believe are still available, but any relatively inexpensive user-friendly camera would be fine. You're also gonna want batteries, a good supply of them, and a charger. Um, so I'm talking about rechargeable batteries. If you were to buy regular batteries, you're probably gonna spend a lot more money. And since you wanna keep using this activity um, style over and over again, having the rechargeable batteries is really helpful. The other two things, um, it, it depends on you whether you have the resources, but they can really be handy. Having the tripod, 
can really help reduce the amount of jitteriness and moving around that's going on while the students are filming. So those are helpful, not essential, but I like to use them. Finally, once you've gathered all your equipment, some things I've done to help protect my investment is I've engraved each of the cameras with my school name and a number. And make sure and allow time at the end of your class period to get things checked in and checked out. I think the chaos that sometimes happens when students realize time is running out is also the most likely time when something could get overlooked or you realize uh, after they're all gone, then, oh, something's missing. So to make sure and leave a bit of time for that. And I always have them check out a camera number and then I check the camera number when they check it back in. All right, so what if you're not a science teacher? Um, I wanted to share a few other ideas I've come across as I've been reading about applications of student produced video. And these are some of the ones I thought were pretty good. Uh, I read about how in English classes you could use one minute vocab videos and it gives students a lot of ways within one minute you can show several different applications of a vocabulary word. You could do book reviews for your school library. So then not only is it something that's helpful for students to um, think back about what they've read, but it also could be helpful for their peers and there's that it added motivating factor that well they know one of their classmates or someone else at the school might actually watch this when deciding why they want to check out a book. You could reenact scenes from history or from literature. In math classes, you might consider having students document story problems and how they approach them and ideas for solving or strategies. And finally, video cameras lend themselves wonderfully to doing interviews. These might be really helpful in a lot of social studies type situations. And finally, a few other resources for you. If you are going to purchase equipment, I highly recommend checking out REMC bids. They have a lot of very competitive prices and I actually bought several of the equipment that uh, pieces that I use with my students from REMC bids um, because I was able to find uh, really competitive prices there and it's a good deal. You can get a lot of bang for your buck. So, you know, I'd say check it out whenever you're looking for particular technology pieces. The other is uh, a blog of a librarian at a mid middle school and it's uh, the daring And um, this is a pretty fun blog. She has all kinds of ideas for technology applications. And finally, if you'd like to contact me, my email address is bell at panthernet.net. And I hope you found this video to be uh, helpful to you and I hope it's given you some good ideas.